Hi, I'm Jeff Haas, creator and writer of The End of All Terminus and the host of the Traversing the Stars podcast, where I host the stars of entertainment and comic books. And you're watching and listening to Two Geese Talking with the best host there is, Kurt Sasso. I didn't pay him to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geese Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries and of course i'm your host kurt sasso we're joined today on this show with a very talented and creative individual he's well actually i shouldn't say he's been on the show in the past because this is his first time on the show but you know his work of course from being the host of traversing the stars and a very talented individual as an interviewer but he's joined today as a comic creator and writer for an amazing series called the end of all things terminus joined today by jeff haas how you doing today you're very well. How about yourself? Doing good. Doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm a comic book writer. I have a couple of titles that some people may know. Nightmare Patrol, Malik Renning Devil, Santa Claus. And now I'm doing The End of All Terminus. People may also know me as a publicist of a great indie group of people, which you can check my page. You'll know who they are. First in the stars, I'm a podcast owner, publicist. So that's me in a nutshell. You got so many irons in the fire there. I don't know how you keep it all straight. <laughs> Use my notes on my phone with every day I put on a, a list of things I have to get done that day. And one by one, I delete them off it as I accomplish certain goals. <laughs> I, I, I have to be or I'll totally get lost. There's too much going on between that work. I don't write it down. I'm totally going to get lost. (laughs) Well, let's, let's talk about more happy things then, <laughs> and, and more geeky things in that matter. Of course, I know you from being a host of Traversing the Stars and looked at your comic work as well too, but looking at the end of all things Terminus, why is that an important story for you to write and get out there in the comic world? It just allows for so many different things I want to talk about, questions of humanity, questions of uh, different cultures and society. It's kind of like that epic in my head that it's been stirring for such a long time that I finally just want to get it out. And I want to be able to talk about all the things that I'm interested in. And this gives me a great opportunity as an allegory to share all those ideas on religion, culture, society, people, everything. And I think it's going to be a a fantastic ride and I get to kill off a whole bunch of people. So it's it's going to be a lot of fun. (laughs) Fictitious people at that, yeah. I I think in my head, I start off on the ship. The Terminus is the name of the ship. There's going to be a couple hundred thousand on the ship when it all starts. And probably by the end, I'm looking at between eight to 12 survivors. So a lot of people are get to die. (laughs) You know, what's the most misunderstood aspect about the sci-fi genre that maybe people who don't follow it don't understand? Don't respect it. Maybe take things for kids. It's also an idea of sci-fi being geeky and it's just kind of like tech babble instead of story. And I think a lot of people also take it as pure entertainment when the great sci-fi stories and most of them, Star Wars, Star Trek, anything like that, are deep allegories with big ideas behind them and a lot of scope. And I think people need to respect the genre for that. I mean, we're so inundated with sci-fi as it is, and it's a great genre, like you mentioned, but I think everyone automatically gravitates towards, okay, if it's sci-fi, it's a Star Trek. You know, mm. If it's a an epic, it's a Star Wars. There doesn't seem to be any real leveling of the playing field these days. It's independent creators like yourself that actually get to finally showcase the, the talent that's out there. I think the broader audience needs to except sci-fi and i think like i said i think it's easily dismissed as something that's not identifiable something that people can't connect with that's something that people feel intimidated by just because of the techno aspects of it and people think it is just pure nerd material but it's not it is fun i mean star wars extremely a fun series star trek even with all the philosophy and everything else that's in part of it it's still great entertainment and i think people are afraid of approaching something that they're going to be intimidated by obviously yourself as a creative person it's wonderful to have a team around you who are the people that have worked with you on this particular series the artist behind the book is brad ship who's a, a wonderful artist his work he creates these great designs for these aliens the ship is fantastic looking the designs inside the ship they just look epic Everything about Brad Ship is epic. The story is going to be black and white at the moment. So he is the penciler and the inker and providing the, you know, the gray tones of things of that nature. I think a lot of people are going to be impressed with what he has. And the aliens look badass, yeah. which is what you need in sci-fi. If the aliens don't look cool, you lose the sci-fi fan base. <laughs> and that's the one thing I noticed about the preview you sent me here. It was this contrast of the darks, the lights, the gray tones. I think the epitome of a good artist is not how they color, but how their black and whites stand next mm. to what they can do in color and then we look at terminus here it's up in that level because i mean the detail this should be a manga 
Like this should be like part of the Japanese culture. Like why aren't why aren't you like promoting this in Japan? <laughs> I, I wish I was better, from, more familiar with manga because they sell so well right now. There, there's such a, a boost in, in manga sales. At the end of the day, what Brad Ship does, he gives each alien a sense of their culture. When you look at the Citadel, which is belonging to the uh, acolytes of Devo, he just gives it the gothic scope that they deserve. The ship matches, the rooms match the aliens, the ship feels alive, and it feels organic and tangible. It wouldn't work if it just whole thing just felt like just a random organization of rooms and shit, but he makes it look that like it's real, that you can feel someone sitting in there and living there. And you can see the different aliens and you can see their voices are on the ship as well. It's not just everything just looks cookie cutter area. You can tell by look at me when you look at part of that ship, Ah, that's where these aliens are spending their time. You know, that's their spot. And it, I think it really works. And I, there is an idea that when we hit $3,000 as a stretch goal, we may consider color. But for now, I think black and white is the way to go. And it kind of gives it more epic looking at scrolls almost. <laughs> The Kickstarter campaign is currently ongoing right now, which is uh, great to see. And, and you have a lot of progress with it so far here. What are some of the tiers that you're looking to showcase with this particular campaign? And what can we expect? All right, well, there's a lot of cool stuff. There's variant covers. Uh, Dave Valencia is doing a kick-ass mm -hmm. cover. You probably know uh, Chris Michael. He's doing a crit Terminus, uh, end of all Terminus crossover cover with uh, our character Thraxis and, and, and one of his characters. They're going to be arm wrestling on the cover, which is going to be pretty cool. Good little crossover right there. Uh, we're going to have t-shirts. We're going to be selling prints as well. And the cool thing is to Brad Ship, apparently he's an expert at making a 3D mod uh, as a 3D modeler. So he's he has 3D models of the ship he's, we're, we're going to be selling. So you can have your own little ship, I guess, action figure yes. <laughs> that you can, you can put out there. Um, I think it's like uh, eight inches in, in size. I think something along those lines. It's there. Buy that as well. We're going to have stretch goals as well, uh, stickers pens as well we're considering adding a one for mugs as well that you can put on there but there's gonna be a comic store incentive as well where you can buy a bunch of ours at a good price it's something like 60 bucks for like 10 copies something along those lines yeah i mean we're, we're trying to do everything we can to get people interested you can buy all the three variant covers all at once there's obviously the digital which is gonna be kind of cheaper i think we're putting it at like two dollars i believe a two dollar digital it, for, for something that's a pdf it takes me five seconds seconds to email <laughs> someone screw it two bucks i don't want to rip anybody off yeah, <laughs> i mean it's probably cost me 10 cents to put it together and the dollar fifty it goes to bread. <laughs> the first step stretch goal that we have is basically just going to be basically is just tip the artist. Brad Ship, he's a great guy. He's doing it at a relatively low price for an artist. If someone's do doing it kind enough to price himself low to make sure the combo gets made, if it does well on the campaign, tip the artist. We want to make sure he gets his little extra for helping us out, helping the project. But like I said, eventually colors a stretch goal being around $3,000. The goal we have is at 1200 and, and the goal for that hopefully is hit fast. That's reasonable though. You're obviously, you're balancing things out and you're budgeting accordingly. And that's a responsible thing to do for a campaign for creating a Kickstarter rather than going something crazy like 10 grand and then just not meeting. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the great thing is one, if you're going to do something like this, you got to hit your goal. The second most important thing is two, is try to make price things so you're not ripping off the people who are nice enough to pledge to you. The issue itself, the hard copy, first physical tier, is nine dollars once again it's not a huge profit margin for us feel free to add a tip but when you think about the cost of printing think about the cost of giving it to brad you know it should be priced in my opinion as something that's reasonable i don't want to do a 24 page comic book and have it priced at like 20 bucks it seems a little bit unfair to a pledger who just wants to uh, read your book so then as a creative person that you are in, in many different fields what's the hardest part about being a comic book creator is it the beginning the middle or the end of your process all of it. <laughs> There's many difficult parts of being a comic book person. First off, the writing is hard. I think sometimes writers don't get the credit they deserve for the difficulty of their part of the job, but it's a, it's a hard thing. It's a lot of thought. It's a lot of stress, anxiety, trying to make sure everything works. Cast this large as well. takes a lot of organization and a lot of plotting and planning. It's hard to get the word out there. There's a lot of noise online. A lot of people are doing their Kickstarters, but tons of indie people out there. And it's great. It means we're in the golden age of indie comic books, but you're basically streaming into traffic and hoping that someone hears your voice at the same time someone's hearing the sound of you know, everything else making their noises you just gotta lot, yell a little bit louder there's patience i mean good art doesn't happen overnight you can't be like 
hey, I'm an indie guy paying you this, get it done in the next two weeks. It's not how it works. The artist needs time to produce at a good quality. You got to be patient. They also have their own lives and you're not paying them enough to live full time off what you're paying them. I mean, I don't have that kind of cash. You got to be patient and let the artists give them time to produce the work. And you kind of have to sit back and trust the artist is going to get it done. Brad is great communication with me. I made that a lot easier. All of it's hard. I mean, then you're begging for money. You're pimping out yourself like, someone please buy my book. You're, you're like a panhandler on the street corner. <laughs> begging for money. It's hard. It's a little humbling. It's part of the process of being indie. It'd be nice if DC wanted to add it to a vertical thing right now. So if they're listening, go right ahead. The odds are I'm not getting a phone call from DC Vertigo going, or I guess it's Black Label now going, hey, we'll give you all this money, make our book. You know what I'm saying? So you got to do what you got to do. And it's part of the job is just to sell yourself as much as humanly possible. Embarrass yourself if you have to. Scream louder if you need to and get your book sold. For the price of a cup of coffee, you too could support an independent comic creator. <laughs> I think I'm just putting on the cover, just me holding like a cup or one of those signs for like, we'll write for money, you know, and just uh, have it out there from my, uh, on my, on my Kickstarter page. But every indie person out there is basically a panhandler at this point. <laughs> just, just have Sarah McLaughlin's in the arms of an angel playing in the background as you're doing it. Just, you should put that as the first 30 seconds of your Kickstarter video there as well, too. As a $2,000 stretch goal, I will make a video of me holding my book with the sound of an <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin. I don't know if I get sued for that. I don't know if Kickstarter would allow it. But if it did, I'll make a TikTok video of me holding a sign saying, uh, you know, we'll work for money. And you'll we'll play that in the background. I'll look as sad as puppy dog eyes as much as possible. Two thousand dollars stretch. However, you do that. I'll do the voiceover <laughs> for the commercial narration as well too. <laughs> The fact that this comic is created and the fact that you're getting it out there is, is a wonderful start. Is this a, a one shot or is this going to be a series? Like, what is your ultimate goal for this comic? I'm an ambitious person. <laughs> this is going to be a long form series, one way or another, funded, not funded. It's going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I mean, the question of will be how long of a series it's going to be. And I don't want to go into quite those numbers yet. But if it does well, I have a relatively long series planned. If it doesn't, I have a shorter, long series planned. The end point of the story is already done. It's there. I know exactly how the story ends. And just to be a question of how much do I get to say before I get there? And I'm hoping, because I have a lot to say, and I'm just um, arrogant enough to think I have time to say it. So hopefully it's, it's going to be a relatively long series, is, is, is my guess. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, that's a, that's a really good question right there. It's an interesting story, I guess, about a short story that I wrote back in the day. I've always loved to, to write. My father got me into writing. He's a writer. I'm a writer. It's kind of how it goes. It's in, the, it's in the bloodstream. And when I was in eighth grade, I was doing a lot of short stories and it was time to write a Halloween story. I remember the teacher telling me, I believe in you to write something really scary. I believe you're going to do it. So I wrote a story and apparently they were scared because they never handed it back to me and it ended my permanent record. So language has been <laughs> you got to be careful what you write. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least you weren't called into the psychologist's office, right? I was, in fact. I did. They did have me with the therapist. For, basically, the story, I'll do a quick thing because it's not really about the story, but I'll just go about the story real quick. I was in eighth grade, and I wrote a story about an, an eighth grader who was writing a story about someone who was murdering people. And it turned out that the writer had split personalities. One was the killer. And one was the writer and the people who were murdered were the teacher and the parents. I ended up in the therapy. <laughs> Luckily, this was pre-Columbine. So it wasn't like I was expelled. Yeah, no, there was, there was definitely a talk. There was definitely a talk. And I never, ever received the story back. I don't know where it is anymore. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your varying careers? That's a good question as well. The best advice you can receive is if you want it, pursue it. Make sure all your energy is invested in the pursuit. Do never pursue something that when it fails, you think to yourself later, if I only tried harder. You know what I'm saying? If, if you're going to do it, do it with all your energy, 100%. Don't screw around. Don't take it for granted. Just go for it. I think that's the best advice I can ever think of. If you're going to do it, 100% do it. What are three things in the past that you've accomplished that you were proud of? And what are three things in the future or present that you're looking forward to accomplish? I think I'm most proud of in the many different jobs. I must admit, I do take pride every time one of my clients hit their goals or break a record in either backers or in money. I take a pride on everyone that does it. I get enjoy a little bit of ownership with it and just feel good that I was able to help them out with that. For Traversing the Stars, every video that I post is a victory in, in my head. I made it one more video out there. You're a little bit further along. And then the world of comic books. I have a Vandy wall behind me. You can't tell because I have a picture there. And in the Vandy wall are all the comic books that I've worked on and published and I put them up there with my name on there because I guess I'm an arrogant ass. Every completed comic book feels 
like an accomplishment. Santa Claus, the, the two issue miniseries, the accomplishment, Nightmare Patrol, it's an accomplishment. Sanctus, some short stories that I've published, Malik Raining Devil. Every time one's done, it feels like you climb Mount Everest. You know what I'm saying? I feel good on every time one's done and I feel pride in yourself, you know, and you walk a little stronger. And even though when you walk down the street, no one actually knows who the hell you are in your head you're like i'm jeff of sanctus you know and no one knows no one cares but to you you care for the next like five minutes you care <laughs> is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work feel after reading say terminus i would say there's two uh comics that are really had a, a big impact oh, there's three actually that had a big impact to me from at different stages when i was a little kid there's a issue of just league of america i'm trying to remember which issue it is it's somewhere on my wall i can't remember the number there's certain panels that i just remember Loving. It was the one with Firestorm. There's one with Red Tornado when he's flying towards the helicopter. This was uh, Jerry Conway who wrote the issue. I read it so many times. I think that the pages got like torn apart. I uh, lost the cover, missed some pages on it. I mean, I still have the comic book, but it's not complete. Um, that one, the one that's autographed. I bought a new one just to get the autograph. That one stuck in my memory so much and the characters just embedded themselves in my brain. Then later on, there was a comic book called Extreme Sacrifice from back in the old days with Rob Liefeld and Image. I read that series so many times and I was so impressed with it. The last two issues where they had like these uh, Bible verses in it as well, even though, you know, I'm not religious, but I like the Bible verses. It gave, gave me the sense of what a comic book could be and the kind of scope you can put in and the history you can put in there. And then there's uh, Neil Gaiman and Sandman, which once again, I mean, every time you see Neil Gaiman, you should just be like Neil Gaiman. <laughs> and, you know, he's like the patron saint of all great writing, in my opinion. And if you're going to try writing anything, if you can try to hit 1% of 1% of what Neil Gaiman did in Sandman, you've accomplished something in your lifetime. So my goal, reach the 1% 1% quality of Neil Gaiman Sandman and feel good about it. I mean, you got the epic scope, great characters, great writing. And much like Terminus, when he talked about writing Sandman, he said, the great thing he had about Sandman is that anything he was in the mood to talk about, he could talk about in Sandman. And that for that day, that would be what he would talk about in the story. Terminus was his long form. Give me the same thing. What do I want? What am I thinking about? What do I want to talk about? What ideas do I want to share? And Terminus allows me to do because I have enough time in my head to tell all this part of the story. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My father, I wouldn't be a writer if my father wasn't a writer. I still remember playing in the family room with my toys and watching my father type away at the computer. Back in the old days, it was like those old school, black background, green text, you know, uh, type computers. I'm watching him on the computer thinking and agonizing over the words and sentences stuff like that. I thought to myself, I want to do that. I don't know. It looked painful, but I thought I wanted to do it anyway. So I would say my father was the inspiration to become, to become a writer. From a professional standpoint, you are a multi-talented and successful not only comic book writer, but host and PR person as well, too. So you're professionally successful in many different areas. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, no, I, I will say that I'm one of those people who constantly look over the next hill and think I need to be there or why am, why am I not there yet? So I think no matter what I do, I always think of the next horizon being like, I got to be there. While my victories are enjoyed and are momentarily enjoyed, I always feel I should be at the next one. And that's what drives me to continue doing what I do because I'm very, uh, maybe even, I don't know, competitive is the right word. I want to make it to the next level of success. And I'm not sure what success is going to feel like if I ever will totally feel like sit back and go, I've done it. But I think the reason why I keep doing it is because I'm still reaching for that level of success when I will eventually, maybe one day go, I have accomplished that. So I will say, no, not yet. And I don't know when that will ever happen, but I feel like the line that keeps moving ahead of me when, when I try to get there. Go post moving indeed. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? I don't like the feeling of failure. Um, I don't know anyone who does, but I don't like it. And the only way to stop feeling like you're a failure is to keep moving again. When I do fail, and I, and I failed a few times, you know, or more than a few times, but whatever, sit back for a minute, brush myself off and immediately dive back in. The moment you dive back into the thing, you stop feeling a failure because now you're moving forward yet again. So I think the best way to deal with failure is to just keep moving forward, keep stepping forward. You know, it's like being fighting against a hurricane. You're the hurricane of failure is coming at you because most of like, like baseball, you fail more, you're going to succeed. Keep stepping forward little by little, step by step. And you fight, fight it back. And that's the best way to overcome failure is just to keep moving forward. That's a new one. I like that. <laughs> that's a good phrasing, actually. I, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a host of a show or whatever the case may be. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you looking up to you as it is, then 
Hopefully you're inspiring them in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? The key for to inspiration is just doing it. Lead by example. I don't know if anyone is literally looking up to me, but if they are, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever. But the best thing to do is just model success by being successful. But I keep trying. If anyone ever does look at me uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago, anything I've ever accomplished, Hopefully the main thought they have is he kept going. He kept moving forward. So what's the best thing for them to do? Keep moving forward, model effort, model dedication, a model principle. And hopefully the next generation then looks at you and then hopefully it snowballs. You're hopefully the voice of another generation that's working even harder, pushing even further and are even more ideal um, with principle than the ones that came before. And in my opinion, that's the best way to hopefully be a good model of being a, a living person. If your life was a comic book or a show, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? I think it would be, well, dot, 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 he tried. <laughs> what would it sound like? There was a, a movie that had a soundtrack that I can't remember the name of it. it was, it's not Devils in the Details. I think it was something along those lines. And it was from a movie called Hannah. And I saw reason I just seen it in the background. It's kind of like this weird, kind of like bouncy type. Sound that sounds half goofy, but half somewhat intimidating at the same time. That'd probably be mine because it's, it's half screw up, half somewhat scary for anyone who might have lived it. But I think that would probably be the, the theme track. And it would be, well, he tried. And then the, the sound would, the, the music would kick in with <laughs> the devils in the details. That, that's what I'd be thinking. <laughs> Is that the one that was a Swedish film and then they turned it into a TV series? I believe so, yes. That, that was a good film. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it goes, it's something that goes like dun, 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 dun. It's something like this, this is that one. Yeah. And it, it's, it's something just about it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that's one I would want to be my theme. I would like to be, you know, the one I would want would be the Superman theme from the Christopher Reeves 1978 oh, yeah. one. Yeah. That's soaring and powerful. But I think I'm going to end up with Devils in the Details. <laughs> Take what you can get. I got it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, Jeff, I hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, it was totally my pleasure. Thank you so much. And see you again, I guess, is in March. Join yes. I think it's March 28th. Yeah, March. And then we'll have a, a follow-up in June as well, too. Indeed. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find the Kickstarter campaign online right now? All right. There's a lot of ways to support me. Um, give me your money. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, um, you can follow me on Twitter on, at Terminus Comic, uh, at Terminus Comic. You can find me on Facebook the, uh, under Terminus. Uh, or just follow me directly at Jeff Haas. The Kickstarter is live. So look at um, the end of all Terminus. You'll find it on Kickstarter uh, right now. So uh, give what you can, pledge, you know, obviously get your rewards. I'm on Instagram, on TikTok. Uh, follow me on YouTube at Traverse of the Stars as well. Think about me, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> just do whatever you can to help me out. And I appreciate it. And if I haven't said thank you, assume that I meant it. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You could, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word to you, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel, it's a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And the podcast is back after 12 or so years. I've, I've lost count, but it's back finally in 2023. At twogeekstalking.podbean.com, but you can find it on any streaming services. Do me a favor, like and follow it and share it with the masses. This interview with Jeff, along with many others, are going to be available. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.